Well, it's official, folks. Barry Morphew is going to sit in jail for at least another 24 days waiting for Judge Patrick W. Murphy to reconvene this preliminary hearing that just ended. He'll then allow the prosecution and the defense one more chance to argue their position. The state wants Morphew bound over to face first-degree murder charges in the death of his wife, Suzanne Morphew. The defense argued that a decision today was warranted, stating that Morphew had already sat in jail long enough. Hey folks, you're not alone if this case continues to bounce your emotions from one extreme to the other. I mean, many of us are wondering why it appears the court is being extremely accommodating to Morphew and the defense, while others are thinking, did the prosecution prove their case over this four-day trial? Well, please take a moment, hit that like and the subscribe button and ring the bell so that you receive all of our notifications on videos like this one. So (laughs) where are you after 20 plus hours of courtroom drama? Did the prosecution provide enough probable cause for Judge Murphy to bind Barry Lee Morphew over for trial? Or did that crack defense team of Eitan and Nielsen stop the groundswell? Let's take a minute and recap the last two days. On Monday, August 23rd, the defense came out swinging with experts on mobile vehicle data. They challenged the state's witness who declared that he thought Suzanne's cellular phone data proved that Barry Morphew was chasing her throughout the house. The defense argued that the data didn't make sense and that it suggested that Morphew was somehow running through walls and moving at incredibly high speeds. The defense was right in my opinion. Cellular data is tricky and it requires a careful analysis to understand what it's telling us. If you go back to my video yesterday, you'll see that I used an example of my mobile phone sitting in an office. Go back and watch that earlier video. That's where I explore cell phone triangulation and Wi-Fi hotspots and internal GPS device locations in detail. Now I've talked over and again on this channel about how important circumstantial criminal cases can be and, and really how valuable they can be. What really stood out to me was this reminder that Suzanne's phone and her communications were consistent. They were normal until the early afternoon on May 9th. Then things changed. More importantly, her phone was never recovered. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, Barry told investigators early on that one of his possible scenarios was that Suzanne simply left town, ran away. Really? Ran away from her children? Her family? And now we know her boyfriend? And don't forget, if in fact she did run away, she forgot and left her purse behind, her identification behind, her money, her vehicle. You know, a vehicle that you would expect her to take if she was fleeing, even going to an airport or heading off to meet someone. And let's talk a little bit about the tranquilizer gun. There has been so much ado about the cap to the tranquilizer gun. Not that discovering the cap led to a number of questions and theories, but that it was initially seen by deputies in the dryer and passed over, only to be collected on subsequent investigation. Now, the defense implied that it may have been planted there. The prosecution, I thought countered with simply asking the deputy on the stand, did you plant that evidence? His response was a resounding no. The tranquilizer cap led to the tranquilizer gun in the garage. Now, the deputy didn't think that it was operable. Does does that mean that it isn't? I mean, I'm really wondering if anyone ever thought to try it out, to pull the trigger and, and test it with a round to see if it worked, answering the question once and for all. The rifle, though, led searchers to recovering a box of darts in the safe that was either empty or partially full. We learned that Barry, in this case, doesn't drink coffee, apparently. Again, I found myself saying, really? 
isn't there a forensic check of the cup to see if Suzanne or Barry's DNA was on it? I mean, it seems that that would answer a lot of questions and resolve a lot of things. The defense argued that only Suzanne and one of the daughters drank coffee every morning. Remember, the daughters were out of town. And uh, speaking of coffee, the defense argued that Suzanne's text to Barry said, I'm done, and that that had nothing to do with their relationship. The defense argued that Suzanne was just telling Barry that she was done having coffee with the neighbor. That probably makes sense to the defense since they suggest that Barry and Suzanne shared a steak on a plate and a romantic evening together that night of May 9th. Or we can choose to believe the prosecution who countered that Suzanne was telling a friend that she and Barry haven't had a good night in over a year. And folks, while we're thinking about this, remember that Suzanne was in the middle of an affair she would need to be a pretty darn good actor or Barry would need to be pretty out of touch with what's going on to not think something's off. Now, I I don't know. I mean, I've heard examples where uh, there have been people who can really act well. Now, here's the thing I love about circumstantial evidence cases. They almost always rely on multiple forms of evidence. Sometimes it's circumstantial with forensics, sometimes physical In some cases, there are even confessions or admissions, but the one common denominator in circumstantial cases is that they point to something that's obvious. Things like Suzanne's phone usage abruptly ending around the same time as testimony suggests that Barry returns to the house on May 9th. Now, is that coincidence or is it circumstantial evidence? Or things like the fact that Barry told investigators that he turned west onto Highway 50 in pursuit of a herd of elk on that early morning Mother's Day. Remember, there was testimony by investigators and the media that Barry reportedly said he left the home at 5 a.m. Now, as we talk about this piece of circumstantial evidence, pay close attention to this graphic example of the visibility that morning. Sunrise was at 5.50 a.m., so there was a little bit of light beginning to show. There were remnants of a moon, as shown in this graphic, while it progresses from 4.30 a.m. to 5 a.m., when Barry reportedly looks at Suzanne sleeping in bed, gets in his vehicle, and drives away. Now, 50 minutes later, the sun would rise. Keeping those lighting conditions in mind, let's chat about Barry's statement to investigators that he was hoping to see where the elk herd was going that he saw run across the road. That way he could gather some antler sheds, the the antlers as they fall off. Was it just a strange coincidence that this was the same area where the deputies recovered Suzanne's helmet, or is this circumstantial evidence? Now, before we leave the part about the elk, I was also troubled by statements that it was a herd of elk. I've lived in an area my entire life that is filled with elk. It seems odd to me to suggest that bulls and cows and calves are traveling together in the springtime at this time of year, April. Now, it's not consistent with my experiences. That doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened. But I also found myself questioning if, given the low level of lighting, that Barry could have even seen antlers, especially given, again, that most antlers are gone between January and March. Now, Some bulls will drop their antlers in early April, but it's less common. So is this just another rare coincidence or is it circumstantial evidence? Now, was it a strange coincidence that Barry's phone was on airplane mode, meaning that the device location couldn't be tracked? In those critical evening hours on May 9th, Uh, Through the early morning hours of May 10th, when Suzanne disappeared, that phone was in airplane mode. Now, is that coincidence or is it circumstantial evidence? If it's circumstantial and tied to the disposal of Suzanne's body, then we got to also consider the logistical challenge that this presents for investigators to recover the body. We all want that body recovered. 
Well, this map represents the vast area that Barry could have traveled in that six hour period of time. Uh, it's incredible, folks. That's more than 10,000 square miles. And, and what about the five trash runs that Barry reportedly made on the trip to Broomfield? Was it just a bizarre coincidence that Barry made five trips to five different dumpsters? E even though he reportedly didn't include the bus stop, the men's warehouse? Or is this circumstantial evidence? And since we're in Broomfield, let's not forget the strong smell of chlorine in the room. Keep in mind that everything we know at this point is based on tweets that are coming out of the courtroom. But did the hotel manager say that the pool caused a lingering chlorine smell in the room that Barry stayed in? Or did the hotel manager say that the smell of chlorine remained in Barry's room that he stayed in for a number of days, if not longer? Now, was it just a coincidence that Barry's room happened to be the one that smelled that way? Or is that circumstantial evidence? And don't forget under Sheriff Rorich, who testified that he found signs of forced entry on the inside frame of the master bedroom in the Morphew home. Was it just a weird coincidence? Or was this circumstantial evidence? I was really intrigued by the recovered, unfired 22 caliber bullet found next to Suzanne and Barry's bed. It happened to be on Suzanne's side, according to reports. Was that coincidence or circumstantial evidence? And wait, there's more. Detectives found a Bible and an Al Anon book, but they were unable to locate something they were looking for Suzanne's personal journal. Then they found what appeared to be a journal in the fireplace, completely destroyed, except for the spine and the binder rings. Now, is this just a coincidence or circumstantial evidence? And I want to ask those of you who keep a journal or a diary, would you destroy something that you spent so much time investing your thoughts, emotions, and feelings into? Now, when Barry was accompanied into his home after learning that his wife was missing, and you remember he was crying crocodile tears, was it just a strange coincidence that he didn't look around in the house or try to call his wife? Is that a coincidence or is it circumstantial evidence? And when sheriff's deputies discovered and photographed what appeared to be injuries to Barry's hands and arms, described by some as scratch marks. Is that just a weird coincidence or is it circumstantial evidence? And when investigators said the bike appeared to be staged and not an artifact of a wreck or a collision, coincidence or circumstantial evidence? And folks, don't forget Barry's statement to investigators where he asked about immunity if he were to open up his life to deputies. Is that just a poorly timed coincidence or is it circumstantial evidence? Now, when Barry told investigators that his marriage was great and that he and Suzanne were happy, while at the very same time evidence is coming forth that his daughter was telling Suzanne to get a divorce and a restraining order, was that just coincidence or is that circumstantial evidence? And when Barry told the world he was spending every day searching for his missing wife, yet he refused to help Suzanne's family when Andy brought an army of 700 people into to search. Was that a, a coincidence or is that circumstantial evidence? Well, let's stop there and just ask this simple question. Do you think that the prosecution provided the court with enough circumstantial evidence to bind Barry Lee Morphew over for a jury trial in the murder of Suzanne Morphew? Or did the defense show that Barry is a victim of investigative error and misconduct? I'm going to really enjoy reading your comments down below, and I hope that you'll take time again. Hit that like and the subscribe button. Join the Profiling Evil family. It's there that you'll get notified when we release other videos like this one. 
I want to thank Profiling Evil family members Gabby and Allie for braving the early morning hours to watch this preliminary hearing and to keep me updated with regular tweets and texts and phone calls throughout the days of what happened, what was going on inside this tightly regulated hearing, and what the emotions were outside. We're going to all have to wait until September 17th to hear the judge's ruling on whether Barry Morphew will be facing criminal charges in a jury trial. We hope that we're also going to hear about the release of that 127 to 130 page arrest affidavit. In my opinion, the affidavit should have been released now that the preliminary hearing's over, but I guess we're going to just have to wait to hear what's contained in it. I think we've already heard much of what's there. And I'm really glad to report that my assessment of Judge Murphy being the one who signed that original arrest affidavit was confirmed today. Well, again, take time to leave your thoughts below on this one. <laughs> Holy cow, what a day this has been. Hey, thanks for supporting Profiling Evil, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.